Hey everybody, and welcome to Metallic Day. Right today, we want to talk about yet another way that atoms like to bond together, called the metallic bond. And this one is quite a special one. Um, it's also very common, as most of the elements on the periodic table are metals. Well, it would make sense that there is a lot of metallic bonding happening. All right. So first off, all right, what is it that makes metallic bonding so special anyway? Well. There's something called the sea of electrons, and that is the main thing that we want to get into today, is this little ocean, this huge amount, vast ocean of electrons that are out there floating around. So, it all comes back to those eight balance electrons again, right? If you look on the periodic table, everybody on the periodic table wants to have eight balance electrons, but sadly, not many of the elements naturally have eight balance electrons, which has led to... Fighting and war is broken out all across the entire periodic table. There's war. It's terrible. There's fighting. Stealing was going on. All kinds of horribleness is happening as atoms are fighting to try to get eight balanced electrons, kind of like that ionic bonding that's going on, right? But there is a group of atoms on the periodic table that is against this, that wants to fight for truth, for justice, for safety and peace among all its friend atoms and everything like that, right? They want um, the war to stop. Right, what is this group? Right, the ones that want to rebel against the war of having eight bounce electrons. They say it's not right that everyone has eight bounce electrons. You should be able to pick and choose and everything like that and have peace. Right, and so what happens is it's the metals, right? The metals are the elements on the periodic table that have taken charge of this. And again, that is most of the periodic table right there, right? And so what they do is they say this is ridiculous, that we're all fighting over having eight bounce electrons. Instead, what they do is they give up their electrons, right? Let's all just throw away our electrons, just toss them to the wind, to the breeze. And if they do that, right, then there are plenty of electrons for everyone to enjoy and share, right? So this is what we call the sea of electrons, right? So again, you have to imagine yourself shrunk down to atomic level, right? And if you're there with all the other atoms, what the metals have done is shed off their extra electrons, and they're floating around in this giant ocean of electrons around you. So kind of like what's going on right here, right? You have atoms, protons, right? So you have the protons there, and you just have this whoops, this sea of electrons that are all around um, those different atoms. And what happens with that sea is, oops, electrons are free to move around. The electrons can zip around between each other, kind of like in this little diagram right here. So because of that, any one particular atom that needs an electron or two, well, they're all around it. It doesn't, you know, doesn't really matter or anything like that, right? So they have tons and tons of electrons all the time. So this is what's called the metallic bond, right? You've got now positive ions because they've gotten rid of their electrons, right? And they're attracted to the negative electrons that are around each one of them, kind of like in these little pictures, these diagrams that are going on here, right? This is what we call a metal, right? And you can imagine positive versus negative tends to be fairly strong, kind of like an ionic bond. Well, again, that's why most metals tend to be so strong. They have that positive to negative bonding going on all the time between the two of them. Right, so as an example, you can pick whatever metal you want. I'd pick titanium because it's the coolest, but you can pick a whole bunch of other ones that have, you know, this metallic bond going on between them. Um, that brings us to something called an alloy, right? What an alloy is, is going to be a mixture of elements mixed together, um, but you've got to include at least one metal in that to make it an alloy, right? And so what happens is you get a number of different types of what we call metal, but it's not particular an element on the periodic table, right? So by far the most common one is stainless steel, right? If you go home and you um, eat, you know, food and you use like silverware, you know what I mean? It's not usually really silver unless you're super rich and uh, have people that can polish it all the time, right? It's usually stainless steel, right? And so stainless steel is just a combination of different elements on the periodic table. There actually is no one set recipe that everyone uses for stainless steel. Different companies will mix different elements together, especially in different ratios, to make however it is that they want their knives and spoons and forks and things like that to look and feel and um, everything. Uh, some other examples, though, brass, right? If you think about it, on the periodic table, there's no square for brass. There's no square for bronze, although a lot of people seem to think there is, but there's not. And the stainless steel that we did, all three of these are examples where they're all metals but they're all a mixture of several different elements in some cases that are all mixed together to make, you know, that particular alloy that you have, right? Um, so they're used, you know, <laughs> sorry, the pictures. I mean, they're used everything from, you know, sporks, right? Sometimes they use an alloy for that, all the way up to, you know, helicopters, especially the blades of a helicopter 
are very, very precisely made, all right? And often they are an alloy or, you know, some material that's mixed together. It's not just one pure element. So why is it that you want to do this? Why are, what are the properties of these alloys? Well, they tend to be stronger and less reactive. So um, any alloy that you have, it's going to have less reactions, you know, when mixed with other elements, which is usually good because you don't want, let's say, your bike rusting or things like that happening, everything. And they're stronger, right? They tend to be stronger um, for it. So you can kind of custom tailor your type of metal using an alloy to, um, you know, the needs that you have. Do you want one that doesn't rust? Do you want one that's really light? Do you want one that's really strong? Sometimes you're more worried, you know, you just want one that's really strong, but, you know, the weight doesn't matter so much, uh, maybe in a building or something like that. So you can custom tailor your metal that you need, you know, by using an alloy for it. Uh, and that brings us to our deep question for the day, right? What would happen if you mix the Silver Surfer and Iron Man together? They'd be... <laughs> Sorry if you didn't get that, but... Okay. Uh, the last thing we want to get to today, kind of somewhat related to this um, towards the end of our chapter that we're in here, is going to be the two basic types of materials, right? There are two uh, simple ways that you can classify pretty much any type of matter, right? Um, it's either going to be matter kind of like this picture right here with the diamond or the picture of the little puppy dog over here for it and everything. So the first one is crystal and material. Right, and crystalline material, if you could zoom in, if you could get really, really close to it and zoom in and see the actual molecules and even the atoms individually of it, what happens with the crystalline material is, well, look, it kind of forms a pattern, kind of like in this little gift that's over here and everything, right? And what happens with this is because all the atoms are lined up and everything for it, right? There's certain places kind of like right here where you can literally look in between the atoms. Right, and that's why crystalline material, kind of like, let's say, diamonds and rubies and things like that, that's why they, they seem so translucent that you can look through it because you're literally, you're looking between the atoms, right? You know, so they're all lined up in all these rows over and over and over again that you can see through that, right? So that's why they look kind of pretty. That's why they play with light, right? Kind of like here again, right? You can see through like these long tunnels almost between the individual atoms, and that lets light come through the material as you're seeing it. Right, so that's the crystalline shape. Now, the other opposite of this is going to be anamorphic, which would be something kind of like a brick or that puppy that we saw earlier. Anamorphic, if you could zoom in and see all the atoms in an anamorphic material, well, it would kind of look like, a, I don't know, like maybe a bunch of Legos. If you dumped out like a big bucket of Legos on the floor and they're all just mixed up randomly and everything like that, that's why you can't see through a brick. Well, unless there's a hole drilled, drilled in it. But you can't see through it because the atoms are so mixed up. That's kind of like a forest here, right? Here's a forest where the trees are just totally random. It's a natural forest, right? Sure, you can see through a little ways here and there because, you know, just randomly there are little gaps. But you can't see through the whole forest. It's just impossible. Eventually, you're going to run into a tree, right? Whereas with the crystalline material, it's kind of more like an orchard, right? Where now, yes, you could look and look and look for a long, long time. You can see these rows where there's going to be space between the trees, right? So an orchard, that's kind of more like a crystalline material, whereas a regular forest, that's going to be more of an anamorphic material, right, as far as how it looks. Uh, hold on here. Oh, there's the anamorphic again. Oh, here you go. Here's another zoom in of like a crystalline material where you can see through you know, the spaces between the actual atoms for it. Um, oh, and here's another example. Crystalline, everybody kind of lines up nice and neatly and organized. Anamorphic, not so much. Let me show you this short little video, too, talking about uh, metallic bonds. In the periodic table of the elements, metals are all found in the same general area. And most of them have a number of similar properties that can be explained by the metallic bond that is found only between atoms of metals. This type of bond, like all bonds, is based on electronic structure. We can consider the structure of the metal, sodium, for instance, as a typical case. A sodium atom is electrically neutral. In its outermost energy level, it has one electron. This is called a valence electron. Valence electrons are involved in bonding. This single highly energetic outer electron is so weakly held by the nucleus of its atom that in a great aggregation of such atoms, the effect is this. There is a sea of negatively charged valence electrons flowing among regularly arranged atoms 
that have lost their permanent outer electrons. This gives the atoms a positive charge, so we can call them ions. It's the attraction between the positively charged ions and the negative sea of electrons flowing between them that bonds all the atoms together to form the metallic elements. Under the microscope, we can watch metallic bonds forming as atoms of the metal silver arrange themselves into the very precise structure known as a crystal. A repeating pattern called a lattice is under construction. As the atoms move into the lattice, they free their electrons and become positive ions. The metallic bond can explain the similar properties of metals. Metals are used in many everyday objects. This morning when I woke up, I decided to have a soft boiled egg and a cup of coffee. The pot I used is made of metal. The kettle is made of plastic, but the coiled heating element inside it is made of metal. Metals are good conductors of heat. This is the reason why metals are used to make these everyday objects. You would never see a pot made of wood or a heating element made of plastic. Metals are also good conductors of electricity. The wire connecting your kettle to the electrical socket is actually made of many copper wires insulated with a layer of rubber. Think about the shapes of the everyday objects we described. The pot, the heating element inside the kettle, and the copper wires. Notice that they are very different. Metals are malleable. This means that they can be molded into different shapes. Metals are very ductile. This means that they can be stretched into wires. To fully understand, these properties of metals, we must understand metallic bonding. When we talk about metallic bonding, we are actually describing the electrostatic attraction between the metal ions arranged in a lattice structure and the free floating electrons around them. Since these electrons are free to move around, the term sea of electrons is also used. What is a lattice structure? And where have you heard this term before? Let's pause the lesson to think about this and resume when you are done. All right, and then we don't need to keep going. Um, they just keep asking a bunch of questions in the video right there. Uh, the last thing we want to get to is a worksheet bonding and metals that normally you would have in your workbook, but we don't have that. But to make sure that we go over all the important material, we'll just go over it now together. Right, so the first question is, give one example of how metals are useful. Well, again, there are a million ways that they're useful in everything, right? I mean, you can talk about everything from building bridges and airplanes and things like that to the metal heating coil in your coffee pot that you might have, right? <laughs> Next, what's an alloy? Well, remember, an alloy basically is a group of elements mixed together, but you have to have at least one metal um, in order for it to actually be a an alloy. But often they might have several metals in them. What does the phrase sea of electrons mean? Well, remember, the metals are willingly giving up. They're getting rid of all those extra electrons because they're tired of this atomic war where everyone's fighting to have eight valence electrons and saying we're better than you are and everything like that. They know that's just not right. So they give up their extra electrons. Everyone shares them. And this is what gives metals their properties, right? This is why they have all kinds of properties like they conduct their electricity so well. You can imagine if you put electrons on one side of a piece of metal, the electrons are easily able to get through with all the other electrons to the other side um, for it. This is why if you bang a piece of metal, it kind of bends over and things like that because of those electrons moving around. <laughs> Number four, an attraction between those positive metal ions is called the metallic bond. Three properties of metals. Well, again, there are tons of them, but we could say metals tend to be fairly shiny. They're malleable. You can bend them around to the different shapes that you want. They're conductive, right? All of these are because of that sea of electrons that are there. Uh, material made of two elements, right? Alloy, right? At least one of them has to be a metal. And why are alloys, alloys often considered more helpful? Well, remember, they tend to be stronger and less reactive, right? So you can custom tailor the metal to what it is that you want. Okay, this ends our um, metallic bonding video. Make sure you take the quiz.